on behalf of the McLean Center for Clinical and Medical Ethics, uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's lecture in our series on end-of-life care. Um, next Wednesday, um, February 25, um, in, in this room, I apologize also for the shifts in rooms, but in this room, uh, Dr. Mark Shushusky, uh, who's the head of ethics at Loyola Medical School, will give a talk entitled, you have to bear with me, it's a long title, I Will Never Let That Be Okay Again, Medical Student Reflections on Caring for Dying Patients. Um, as I say, that talk will be in this room. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Dan Brudney. Professor Brudney is a professor of philosophy uh, in, the in the university and in the college, associate faculty in the Divinity School, and uh, faculty at the McLean Center also. Dan writes about and teaches about political philosophy, bioethics, the philosophy of religion. He authored the book called Marx's Attempt to Leave Philosophy, published by Harvard. Uh, he's also published many articles uh, on bioethics. Um, I'll just mention a couple of titles. Um, are alcoholics less deserving of liver transplant? I won't tell you the answers, ju just the titles. Um, Pregnancy is not a disease, uh, which appeared last year. Uh, Losing dignity, a review of human dignity and bioethics based on the President's Council report on, on, on dignity. Um, Professor Brudney has served on the program committee for the human rights program at the university, on the board of the Frankie Institute for the Humanities. Uh, he also is an associate editor for the journal Theoretical Medicine and Bioethics, and a member of the editorial board of the journal Ethics. Today, Dan will speak to us on democratic legitimacy and end-of-life decisions. Please join me in welcoming Dan Brudney. The message, philosophers don't do this sort of thing. We speak to small groups. Um, we don't do slides. I've, I brought in a few, but they're terrible. But that's just sort of a concession, because I understand medical audiences. I was once told when I gave a talk at a hospital that you had to have slides, that there had to be some visual toy there for, for people to look at. So I've, I've put up a few. I will no doubt lose track of where the slides should be. So and then I'll remember and flip through them. Anyway. Um, the argument that I'm going to make today uh, rests on a basic premise. Um, that is that in a diverse liberal democracy, um, it's not only important how the state deploys its course of power, but why it does so. It's important to determine what are the proper reasons that could provide a justification for the state's use of its coercive power. The state deploys its power, for instance, in making the physician assisted suicide punishable by a jail term then it must do so for the right kind of reason. I'll argue that if we accept this basic premise and if we also accept a particular account that specifies the content of the right kind of reasons, it will then be difficult, although I want to stress not impossible, to justify a criminal prohibition of physician-assisted suicide. So my argument's going to be an argument in political morality. That is, it's an argument about the moral constraints on state action. It's not going to be an argument about personal morality. So I'm going to be prescinding from the substantive question of whether physician-assisted suicide is morally permissible. As with some other questions, one might believe that a particular kind of action is immoral, and you might criticize people who do it, criticize them severely, and yet you might also believe that it would be morally wrong for the state to forbid such an action. Many people, for instance, feel this way about abortion. Many people are personally opposed to abortion and yet believe that it should be a legal option for women. In a similar way, the question of one's personal view of assisted suicide and one's view about whether assisted suicide should be legal could diverge. Now, every so often I'm going to invoke American constitutional jurisprudence. I do, do this to show that the ideas that I'm presenting have a foundation in our own cultural history and commitments. However, my argument is an argument about political morality, not about constitutional law. It's an argument about the conditions for the exercise of state power to be legitimate. The argument I give is deeply derivative from 
an argument presented as an amicus curiae brief to the Supreme Court in 1996. The authors of that brief were the philosophers Ronald Dworkin, John Rawls, Robert Nozick, Thomas Nagel, Judith Jarvis Thompson, and Tim Scanlon, thus mostly liberals, but not only. I'll be supplementing what is in that brief, but the basic thought is already there. That doesn't trouble me. First, obviously, truth comes before originality, but also part of the point of the philosopher's brief, as it's often called, is that the argument itself has been long founded in our own political history. Now, when thinking about bioethics policy, it's important to separate, by the way, if this becomes just terminally annoying, please let me know. I seem to be going up and down. Um, in thinking about bioethics policy, it's important to separate three questions. There's the question about whether a proposed action is morally permissible or impermissible. There's the question of whether a proposed action should be forbidden by the law. And there's the question, if the proposed action is not legally forbidden and shouldn't be legally forbidden, whether it's at odds with the best account of the professional standards of the group that would perform the action. My focus is on the second question. Of course, if I'm right about the second question, that assisted suicide probably ought not to be prohibited by law, we'd then have to add, tackle a third question, namely whether those who engage in assisting someone in suicide um, are doing so in conflict with the best account to the professional standards that apply to them, for instance, that apply to physicians and other healthcare workers. But that is, as I say, a separate question that's to be reached only if you agree that assisted suicide should be legal. So, so I want to begin with a place where constitutional law and political morality might be thought to converge. The public display of religious symbols, for instance, of a crash on the lawn in front of City Hall. There's more than one reason why such a display might be a morally impermissible transgression of the line between state and religion. First, the meaning of a crash on city property is that Christianity is the favored religion of the city and that other religions have second-class status. That's the view of Justice Sandra Day O'Connor in her concurrent opinion in the 1984 case of Lynch versus Donnelly. There, Justice O'Connor writes that a creche sends a message to non-adherents that they are outsiders, not full members of the political community. O'Connor's point is not about the intentions of the older men and older women who may have voted to display the creche. It's about the objective meaning of such a symbol in our culture at this time. However, if we knew the intentions of the older men and older women, we might find those intentions themselves to be objectionable if, say, their intentions were to advance the hegemony of Christianity to express the view that Christianity is the one true religion. So there could be two reasons to object to the creche, one having to do with the meaning of a creche on government property, one having to do with the intentions of the legislators. In other cases, however, these two types of reasons could diverge in terms of their constitutional status. Thus, let's imagine that Roe versus Wade is overturned and that a state enacts a statute that makes abortion a felony punishable by a jail term. The statute is enacted by a majority vote in both houses of the state legislature. The legislators then talk to the media, and they're surprisingly candid. It turns out that every legislator who voted for the anti-abortion criminal statute did so because he or she belongs to a particular religious sect, let's imagine it's the same for all the legislators, that forbids abortion as contrary to God's command. Note that the purpose of the statute is not to proselytize on behalf of this religious sect, nor does the prohibition have the palpable symbolic meaning of the creche on the city hall lawn. It's not obvious that the statute would violate the First Amendment of the US Constitution. I'm, we'll leave that to the constitutional lawyers. I do hope that it seems intuitively clear that something is amiss here that a statute enacted solely on the basis of one group's religious beliefs comes perilously close to what happens in a theocracy. I hope that it seems clear that as a matter of a plausible political morality for a diverse democratic society, the reasons that the legislators have for their votes are not the right sorts of reasons. The underlying thought is that when we exercise our collective power over someone, we need to give that person a justification for our exercise of power.
If legislator Jones votes to prohibit citizen Smith's religious practices, Jones must give Smith a reason, and it must be the right kind of reason. So here's the wrong kind of reason. Your religion, Mr. Smith, is false and hated by the one true God. Now, that could be the right kind of reason, in other, or at least a permissible reason, even if in its own way despicable, in other contexts, for instance, might explain why Jones refuses to invite Smith to dinner. It's the wrong kind of reason, at least in a diverse democracy, to justify state criminalization of Mr. Smith's religious practices. Here could be the right kind of reason. Mr. Smith, your religious practices involve the use of highly flammable substances that pose a significant risk to neighboring residential buildings. Public safety considerations justify or prohibiting your religious practices in densely populated areas. Now, we all know that such a justification um, might be uh, merely um, a facade for religious hatred, um, and it might be defeasible if Smith provides adequate fire protection. Still, it is the right kind of reason. It's not about the correctness or incorrectness of Mr. Smith's belief, but about a genuine public welfare consideration that is independent of the correctness or incorrectness of Mr. Smith's beliefs. So I want to be clear about what's unusual when it comes to the justification of the state's coercive power. Normally, we seek after truth, or at least after sufficient reasonableness. We look for good reasons without considering to whom those reasons are to be given. We try to determine what is in fact true. However, when our actions will affect others' lives in a non-trivial manner, we may feel that we have to do something else, or at least something extra. We have to justify our actions to those who are affected by our actions. And this is especially the case when the other person might be coerced and even more so when the source of the coercion is the collective power of a democratic polity. Now, we invoke reasons in different ways. Sometimes we invoke a reason to explain someone's conduct. Willie Sutton said that he robbed banks. Why did Willie Sutton say he robbed banks? That's where the money is. That's where the money is. Now, we can all take that to be an explanatory reason. That helps us to understand what it is that Willie was doing and why he did it. I take it most of us will not take that to be a justifying reason, a reason that provides a legitimate and powerful justification for what Willie did. Now, some reasons can't count as justifying reasons for a person who doesn't have a certain belief. If you say that Christianity is the revealed religion as shown by the sacred text the New Testament and that you are suppressing my religious practices because the revealed religion condemns those practices, I can take what you say as an explanatory reason. It enables me to understand why you're doing what you're doing. I can't, however, and this is a logical point, it's not a psychological point, I can't logically take this reason to be a justifying a reason that I could take as a candidate, maybe not even a good candidate, but as a candidate to justify what you're doing, unless, like you, I believe that Christianity is the revealed religion. So for me to think about this as a justifying reason, I have to already accept a fundamental premise that you have, and which, as it happens, I don't have. So why should justifying reasons, at least when it comes to the exercise of our collective coercive power, have the special feature that the other person must be able to see the reason as a candidate justifying reason without having to say, change her religion. The thought is that it's a form of disrespect to coerce a person on the basis of a reason that she cannot see as a justifying reason. People should be able to affirm the laws that coerce them, or at least be able to affirm the laws that coerce them with regard to certain fundamental liberties. If we propose to use our collective power to infringe a fundamental liberty, it seems a form of serious disrespect to impose our power, especially where the affected person is a member of the relevant we, on the basis of a reason that she cannot see as a justifying reason. The idea can be put in terms of our capacity to, vision, to pursue a vision of the good life, which is one way of understanding the idea of the pursuit of happiness. If I'm to be a full citizen in a diverse democracy, the legally enforced constraints on my pursuit of the good life should be justified by reasoning that I could accept merely as an equal citizen of the democratic polity and not as an adherent of any particular religion 
a religion-like belief system. Okay, so it matters not just what our legislators do, but why they do it. So let me put my thesis this way. It is pro tanto morally wrong for a legislature to limit fundamental liberties on the basis of reasons that other citizens could not accept without changing their most basic beliefs. So I'm going to gloss this a bit. So first, the phrase pro tanto. It's one of these things philosophers throw in. It means that something is the case absent other overriding considerations. Thus, absent other overriding considerations, it would be wrong for a legislature to limit fundamental liberties on the basis of reasons that other citizens couldn't accept without changing their most basic beliefs. But of course, in a given case, there might be additional relevant considerations, and these might be overriding. An example is a public safety consideration that limits your freedom of speech, say, to shout fire in a crowded theater. Second, I'm going to keep our discussion here to fundamental liberties. I happen to like papaya, banana, mango smoothies. But a legislature might decide to prohibit such smoothies. Perhaps, in practice, such a law would be unenforceable, or it might be foolish because it might spawn an immense black market criminal syndicate specializing in papaya, banana, mango smoothies. That's a separate issue. My point is that I don't think that such a law would infringe a fundamental liberty. By contrast, a law that says that I cannot practice my rather odd type of reform Judaism would infringe a fundamental liberty. For our purposes today, we don't need to find a criterion that dis clearly distinguishes fundamental liberties from lesser liberties. We will ne soon need to, excuse me, we'll need soon to ask whether a liberty, the liberty to seek assisted suicide is tied to a fundamental liberty, but to do so, I don't think we will need to address the general question. I should note also my focus is not only on religious, but also on religious-like reasons. The category of religion can include more than traditional monotheistic religions. Um, the Supreme Court established this in the um, conscientious objection cases during the Vietnam War. Philosophically, this seems to be something most people tend to agree with. Um, who knows? Something called secular humanism might even come under the heading of religion-like. Not religion light, I should say. Um, Finally, I'm proposing a specific standard for the moral legitimacy of state action. Arguably, this standard is implicit and even close to explicit in some of the modern tradition of um, Western political philosophy, and perhaps the constitutional lawyers will say it's implicit in some American constitutional law. To repeat, the underlying idea is that state action that infringes a fundamental liberty ought to be justifiable to those whose liberty is being infringed, and the justification should be of a kind such that citizens could accept it not necessarily would accept it without having to change their own basic view of the world. So after all these preliminaries, let's finally think about the criminalization of physician-assisted suicide. As with any criminal law, this one infringes liberty. Here, the liberty of the patient and the liberty of the physician. Our first question about such criminalization is whether what is infringed is a fundamental liberty. Do patients have, or persons generally, have a fundamental liberty interest in having access to physician-assisted suicide. Um, it might be worth just noting here parenthetically that suicide is not illegal in many jurisdictions, and normally, if it's legal for me to do something, it's also legal for me to get assistance in doing that thing. Or in any event, it looks as if the default ought to be that it's legal to get assistance in doing what is otherwise a legal act, but we can put that aside. Now, I want to be clear on what's at issue. It's not whether a patient has a claim on a physician or on the healthcare system to be assisted in committing suicide. It is whether a patient has a liberty right to receive assistance if a physician is willing to offer it. I do have a liberty right, at least at present, to drink a papaya, banana, mango smoothie. I do not have a claim right that anyone provide me with, with such a smoothie. At issue for us is a liberty to do something not a claim that one be provided with anything. So what sorts of things count as fundamental liberties? Well, liberty has many functions, but I think that the two key functions, at least as political liberty is concerned, are to make secure at least some of the conditions for democratic government and to make secure at least some of the conditions for the individual's pursuit of happiness. So is having the liberty to try um, to uh, end one's life on one's own terms, a fundamental liberty? It doesn't seem to be a, um, a political liberty. 
does not seem to be connected to one's ability to participate in political activities or in the collective process of self-government. Still, it might well be thought to fall within the ambit of the pursuit of happiness. It could be argued that a choice about death is a basic part of the liberty to determine one's own life path in accordance with one's own basic beliefs and values. It would seem clearly wrong to criminalize, on the basis of a legislature's sectarian religious beliefs, a wide range of choices that people make in accordance with their deepest beliefs and their deepest sense of what's important in a human life. For instance, religiously prescribed dietary decisions, days of worship, and many other things. It's been argued that one's death is as important a part of one's life as these other things. So I want to make three claims about being allowed to attempt to die on one's own terms. The first ties assisted suicide to something that we do see as morally permitted, namely the refusal of various forms of care that sustain life. My claim here is not that refusal of care and assisted suicide both aim at death and so are morally equil equivalent. Um, that's an issue that, you know, comes up all the time, uh, much disagreement about it. I want to be clear, that is not what's at issue here. Um, uh, my claim is going to be that at least part of what makes both permissible, what provides a sufficient reason for each, is the role that each plays in an individual's vision of life. The argument starts from the fact that we do permit people to refuse life-saving treatment. There are multiple reasons why we do so. However, I think that one of these reasons, and in itself a sufficient reason, is that we believe that a human life goes better when a person lives it in accordance with her deepest beliefs and values. That's why a refusal of treatment that does not seem tied to a patient's deepest beliefs and values, a refusal that seems arbitrary, is more troubling than a refusal that does stem from the patient's beliefs and values. An example of the first situation can be found in Siegler and Johnson, clinical ethics. You all know this case. A 24-year-old graduate student comes voluntarily to the emergency room accompanied by a friend. Previously in excellent health, he is complaining of a severe headache and stiff neck. Examination of spinal fluid leads to a diagnosis of bacterial meningitis. Administration of antibiotics is recommended. When he's told his diagnosis and that he will be admitted to the hospital for treatment with antibiotics, the patient refuses further care without giving a reason. He will not engage in discussion with the staff about his refusal. The physician explains the extreme dangers of going untreated, serious risk of death or permanent disability, and the minimal risk of treatment. The young man persists in his refusal and declines to discuss the matter further. Other than this strange adamancy, he exhibits no evidence of mental derangement or altered mental status that would suggest decisional incapacity. That's case one. Here's case two. Ms. W., a 35-year-old Jehovah's Witness, refuses a life-saving procedure because it would involve a blood transfusion. She knows that to live, she must have a transfusion, but she chooses to die in accordance with the precepts of her religion. I don't want to get into what, I mean, we could, I suppose, uh, but I'm really not interested in debating whether paternalism might be justified in the case of the graduate student. I want only to note that I think most of us find the Jehovah's Witness case less troubling. That is, you might think that both of these patients are entitled to refuse life-saving medical treatment. But my guess is that you will want to wrestle with that graduate student and try to convince him and talk to him, and in some way, you're going to think something is amiss there, even if you agree that he has decisional capacity, and even if you agree that he ought to be able to receive treatment, but you will be much more at ease with the Jehovah's Witness. If I'm right about that, the question is why? Um, and my hypothesis is that to interfere um, with Mrs. W is to interfere with her pursuit of her conception of the good life. Um, uh, to interfere with, with that by, say, compelling um, her to have a transfusion would, I think, seem to most of us highly problematic. It would seem it's, in effect, to impose a vision of the good life upon Ms. W. Um, whereas with the graduate student, it doesn't look as if that's what you're doing, as if the graduate student has any vision of the good life that's tied to the refusal of treatment in this case. So the next step in my argument is this. If witness-type reasons, what I'll call religious-type reasons, 
are sufficient reasons for being permitted to refuse life-saving treatment, then such reasons are also sufficient reasons for permitting assisted suicide, at least pro tanto. You can see this easily enough. Suppose that there's a religion, call it religion R, that's say much like mainstream Christianity or Judaism or Islam, except that it holds that a devout believer ought not to wish to continue life when she's clearly going to die and is suffering great pain. Religion R holds that such a form of suffering and debility is at odds with God's love and with God's plan for human beings. It's at odds with what it is to be made in the image of God. Religion R holds that assisted suicide is appropriate for believers whose condition is of a certain kind and for whom there is no other path to a voluntary peaceful death. Now, one argument for permitting the witness to refuse treatment was that doing so, and this is, I think, a sufficient reason, would enable her to end her life in accordance with her deepest beliefs and values. So now we'll imagine a Mr. M, an adherent of religion R, and he feels the same way about assisted suicide. If he's unlucky enough to have a terminal condition and to be in great pain, he'll believe, and let's assume that the clergy of religion R would affirm the point they would affirm that God would prefer him to die rather than continue to exist under conditions of misery um, in a way that's at odds with God's plan. The same reason that makes it seem proper to permit, to permit Ms. W. to refuse life-saving treatment seems to make it proper to permit Mr. M. to avail himself of assisted suicide. Keep in mind, all we're talking about is what reasons we have to make certain things legal, not for providing them. So it's perfectly consistent with this point for you to think that you as a physician would not feel comfortable helping Mr. M to commit suicide. The question here is what should the law have to say about it? So the final step of the argument should be obvious. Both the federal courts and our own ordinary morality have held for several generations that what counts as religion need not take a theistic form. As I said, that was the basis of the conscientious objector cases during the Vietnam War. Rather, one's beliefs must merely play the role, kind of role in one's life that paradigm cases of religious belief play in a traditional religious believer's life. About this general issue, at least in constitutional terms, Justice Jackson famously wrote in 1843 in West Virginia State Board of Education versus Barnett, if there's any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, can prescri prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics nationalism, religion. So that's my central argument. The central argument that assisted suicide is tied to a fundamental right, a fundamental liberty rather. It's a general argument and it's not tied to any particular view of the good life. But I want also to note a way in which continued life under certain circumstances might seem to a person to be at odds with her view of what is important and profound in human life. Now I'm giving this example again not as a substantive example that I want to stand by myself, but rather as an example of how a reasonable person might have a view that has the kind of structure and depth to it that would tie it into the request for assisted suicide, kind of structure and depth that, say, traditional religions and other kinds of deeply held values might involve. So, Drawing on work by Elaine Scarry, the philosopher David Sussman has argued that pain can make next to impossible the process of making decisions, of judging that this action is better or worse than that, of seeing something as a reason to do or to forbear from doing something. Once humanity in the sense of the features that distinguish one from other types of mammals becomes much reduced, and if the only way to manage the pain would be via sedation that dramatically decreases awareness, that hardly counts as restoring agency. The point is that one might believe that a feature of what makes a human life human, makes it a life that seems worthy of being lived, has been removed by pain and or sedation, and that one, no, one is in no sense any longer engaged in the pursuit of happiness. If such a condition seems sufficiently imminent, one might think that it would be more in keeping with one's beliefs about what is of value in a human life to terminate one's life before this condition's onset. A similar point is made by another philosopher, David Vellman. Vellman, interestingly, has written important work that raises serious questions about the propriety of assisted suicide. It's not at all clear that on the whole he's always in favor of it. He's, he's an extremely interesting philosopher, Vellman is. But he's also explicit that there can be a conception of dignity that would push us to see the choice for assisted suicide as part of a basic vision of human life. Here's Vellman. When a person cannot sustain both life and dignity, his death may indeed be morally justified. 
one is sometimes permitted, even obligated, to destroy objects of dignity if they would otherwise deteriorate in ways that would offend against that value. The moral obligation to bury or burn a corpse, for example, is an obligation not to let it become an affront to what it once was. Librarians have similar practices for destroying tattered books and honor guards for destroying tattered flags out of respect for the dignity inherent in these objects. These, ob these examples suggest that dignity can require not only the preservation of um, what possesses it, but also the destruction of what is losing it if the loss would be irretrievable. Again, I'm not invoking Vellum's examples as, par, uh, as part of a substantive argument. I'm invoking them to show that someone might reasonably view a thing that she calls dignity as sufficiently important in her life that for her, forbidding her from assisted suicide would count as the same kind of affront as forbidding the performance of religious act. So I've focused on the reasons to permit physician-assisted suicide, but we also need to look at the reasons adduced to prohibit it. In general, there tend to be two classes of reasons for doing so, that is for legal prohibition. Now, one class of reasons would invoke the intrinsic wrongness of assisted suicide. I can't simply go through all the arguments that have been made along this part, but what my suspicion is that when, if one takes any intrinsic wrongness argument and probes it, it's ultimately going to rest on a religious or religion-like thesis. It will amount to the claim if, for instance, the legislature is invoking it, it's going to amount to the claim that their view of human life is superior, um, better than the view of the citizen who is seeking assisted suicide. My argument has been that in moral terms, and I think consistent with Justice Jackson's remarks in West Virginia, uh, Board of Education, uh, perhaps in constitutional terms, I will let Valerie tell me about, and, uh, about that, uh, and Ann Dudley. Um, but in moral terms, um, it would seem to me that this would be at odds with a defensible account of political legitimacy in a modern, diverse democracy to, in effect, tell a patient, your vision of the good life is the wrong vision, and that's why you're not permitted to avail yourself of assisted suicide. The other class of reasons would be instrumental. These rest on empirical premises, and that's where my earlier pro tanto caveat comes in. No liberty is absolute. The legislature's job is in part to regulate liberty. It's part of its job to constrain liberty if the costs or the risks involved in liberty's exercise are too great. Traffic laws, seat belt laws, et cetera, are obvious examples. The question is, what kind of burden must the legislature meet in order to be in a position to say that the exercise of a liberty is too risky? Um, let's return to my penchant for papaya, banana, mango smoothies. Suppose it turns out to be difficult to make sure that such smoothies are safe to, con to consume. There's some weird chemical interaction among the fruit that could be toxic if you don't take very careful uh, methods in, in producing it. Um, and maybe it's really difficult to regulate such things. So the legislature, out of a concern for safety, might decide to just prohibit that particular form of smoothie. Um, I'd be opposed to this, but would I think that they, the legislature had overstepped its bounds? No. And would I think that they need um, really compelling empirical evidence? No. And that's because um, the liberty to have um, a uh, papaya, banana, mango smoothie is not a fundamental liberty. But suppose instead that the neo-Nazis want to march again in Skokie as they did in, I think it was 1977. Suppose the town of Skokie says that to permit the march would be too costly in terms of the number of extra police to be hired uh, in order to maintain order and so forth. Here, the town of Skokie has a very large burden to meet because freedom of assembly is a fundamental liberty. Again, I'll leave it to the lawyers to say whether this burden is, can be cast in constitutional terms. In terms of political legitimacy, there remains a large burden because of the importance of the, of the liberty of freedom of assembly. So my claim is simple. The choice about how one dies is more like freedom of assembly than like the freedom to drink 
papaya, banana, mango smoothies. If I'm correct in that, then there is a high burden on the state. The state will have to meet up a high burden to show that the costs and risks of permitting a suicide, assisted suicide are excessive. Um, I'm in no position to judge whether it's likely that the state can meet this burden. This is an empirical question, like all empirical questions. It could be answered yes or no. So uh, it is possible that upon due reflection, we would decide that although assisted suicide um, does, is tied to a fundamental liberty, the risks of making it legal are too great. Still, it is at least worth keeping in mind two things. One is that many of the risks associated with assisted suicide, and this point often made, are, have analogs with respect to the, the withdrawal of life-sustaining care. In each case, one might be worried that the patient is being pressured. One might wonder, does the patient have adequate capacity? Does the patient really understand? There's a whole set of things that one might genuinely and properly be worried about. To the extent that practice over time seems to have made the American medical system reasonably comfortable with how it is that we judge that it's appropriate to accede to a patient's request to withdraw life-sustaining care, that suggests that at least over time we could become reasonably comfortable with a set of regulations um, for what's involved um, in permitting assisted suicide. Um, second point would be that if this is a fundamental liberty, tied to a fundamental liberty, we ought to have serious empirical work, serious evidence available before we criminalize it. That is, meeting the burden to show that the risks are excessive should not be based on mere speculation. If the thought is that what goes on when you criminalize assisted suicide is that you infringe a serious liberty, then you can justify that only if you really do have good evidence. Um, you might get it, but you shouldn't just speculate. Um, finally, um, here we, there's an old um, metaphor about the laboratory of the states, where the thought is that it's kind of fortunate that we have these 50 jurisdictions in the United States, um, because if they go around doing different things, then when we want to know whether what some particular thing is a good idea, whether, for instance, it can be effectively regulated, if we permit it to happen in lots of states, we'll have data. We'll be able to see whether or not um, this particular form of regulation works adequately, that one is not so good, and we might over time come to some acceptable convergence on what really works. Now, I'm going to close with a couple of reflections about the problem of a slippery slope. Um, the worry about any slippery slope is about drawing a line in a principled way. Keep in mind that the mere fact that it's difficult to draw a line doesn't mean that a line can't be drawn, and the mere fact that the line itself will be more of a gray area than a clear line um, need not keep it, make it the case that, outs, that the areas outside of the gray area are not distinct. Aristotle begins serious ethical analysis in the Western tradition by stressing that in ethics we ought not to look for the precision that we demand in mathematics. His point is that if we demand mathematical precision in ethics, we'll find that we can't get it, and then we'll fail to make the progress in ethics that we are in fact capable of making. So now let's confront the question of how far this is the slippery slope question. It might be appropriate to extend a principle of government non-interference, of permitting legalization of assisted suicide. The strongest case for assisted suicide, the one that most, I think, is most up for grabs is something various states might legislate, is with a patient who has decisional capacity, who's terminal in the sense of being highly likely to die within some relatively short time frame, and who is in considerable untreatable pain. Yet there seems no obvious reason why the principle of government non-interference should be limited to such cases. Let's confront the case of a person who suffered a disability, who could live many more years, who's not in terrible physical pain, who has gone through whatever counts as the standard adjustment period after suffering the disability, and who is now, after due consideration, and after whatever form of psychiatric consultation is deemed appropriate, prefers to end his life rather than to continue to live in a way that, in his eyes, is blighted by his disability. 
May the state regulate assisted suicide in such a way as to preclude its application to this person's case. I want to sort of get this case out there because it's the obvious case that people will worry about if assisted suicide is, is legalized, that there will be a slippery slope from p patients who are in a terminal state to patients who are very much not. Um, now, tear-jerking novels have been written about cases like this. Um, no doubt tear-jerking novels make for rather bad political morality, but they do at least show that our intuitions can be torn and conflicting. So let me try to put the point as clearly as I can. I think it's going to be the case that for any set of regulations designed to ensure that a non-terminally ill patient's decision, one, is uncoerced, two, is made with adequate information, three, is made after adequate reflection, and so on, whatever your set of hedges is supposed to be, for any such set of hedges, there will surely be some patients who will satisfy all of these regulations and will still ask for assistance in ending their lives. In such cases, I doubt that there's a reason to make assisted suicide illegal that doesn't amount in practice to imposing on the patient a conception of what is most important in life and in death. So I do suspect that the principle of government non-interference is what I'm giving a bad label to the thought that assisted suicide should not be illegal. I do think that it will probably extend to such cases. That troubles me. I hope that in practice such cases would be very rare and I'd be in favor of considerable regulation to give life as much of a chance as possible, but I'm hard put to see why at least in principle and with appropriate regulation such cases must be excluded from the scope of what is morally permissible, at least in the sense of um, political morality. Finally, just to repeat something I said earlier, this is how I'm going to end, nothing I've said today entails anything one way or the other as to whether if assisted suicide were to become legal, it would be permissible, obligatory, or impermissible for physicians to provide assistance to those who, after appropriate regulation, due consideration, etc., still wish to die. That's an entirely separate question from the question of the moral propriety of criminalization. Thank you very much. I hope there are going to be lots of questions. So, please, questions, objections. I knew, I knew Dan would have objections. Go for it. <laughs> I'll, st uh, I'll start. Thanks. It was uh, very, very fine, thoughtful, thought-provoking. Um, I think there are um, uh, at least three uh, underlying premises that you uh, didn't defend, and I want to make sure that you at least accept that they're part of the, mm -hmm. uh, the argument. Yep. Um, one um, in the sort of, I'll start from the uh, backwards and go, uh, or, or the last ones and go up to the first ones. Uh, the first is the, in the sort of pain example that you uh, gave, uh, distinguishing, uh, saying that there really it would be worse to be sedated than to be uh, that, than to be killed. Right? Mm -hmm. um, in fact, um, is based on a premise that that the rule of double effect and what one intends and versus mm -hmm. one, what one foresees and does not intend um, is not a legitimate. Uh, distinction in order to be able to sort of, I think, make that argument. Second, going back to the equal protection um, uh, argument that you make, that mm -hmm. sort of we um, have a right to refuse treatment, right? Mm -hmm. um, why can't we then um, have the possibility of right. uh, enacting our death through uh, euthanasia or assisted suicide would um, uh, uh, also depends on the premise that there isn't any defensible distinction between killing and allowing to die, right? Which is, again, I think made more explicit in the uh, in the philosopher's brief that you mm -hmm. uh, um, base your arguments on. And then lastly, um, the very beginning and maybe the, the strongest uh, uh, premise uh, um, is that uh, there isn't any non-religious argument that can be made um, uh, about um, uh, keeping uh, assisted suicide uh, Ill, uh, illegal. Um, uh, and um, you know, just along those lines, we go back to some other things in J. David Velleman's uh, writings, uh, where he talks about interest-independent value, right? Mm -hmm. And one can, in fact, um, argue 
uh, that the very basis for liberty um, mm -hmm. is recognizing the value of the person whose, uh, whose interests we are trying to protect by um, uh, 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 recognizing their, uh, their liberties. Um, and um, while you might not agree with that argument, um, I wonder whether or not that isn't a kind of a line of argument which would be a non-religious right. argument, which would be sort of you know, um, right, in, right. intrinsic without actually being right. um, not any, um, uh, favoring any particular right. conception of life. It's about the argument right. um, from, uh, from liberty itself. So those so, are uh, you know, so, three, yeah. three big questions. Maybe you just want to answer the last one and just sort of say whether you think those other premises are part of the argument as well. The other so, premises right. are not part of the argument. So the last one, that yeah. is, um, it is my contention that a patient's belief that treatment would undermine her vision of what is important and meaningful in life is in and of itself a sufficient basis for refusal of treatment. And um, one could have the same view about the condition of your own deterioration and believe that that would undermine the meaning of your life. And request assisted suicide to prevent that. That has nothing to do with the doctrine of double effect. I, I mean, you and I disagree about that, but it's, but it's independent of that. Similarly, um, the, se the, sec the same thing. That is, um, uh, the question is whether uh, there is a, again, what's, 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 what's up to is, is the question known is, is whether the state should criminalize something. There could be a moral distinction that you want to um, hold between allowing to die and killing you. Yes, you and I disagree about whether that obtains in, th in this kind of case. But what you'd further have to argue is that that's a moral distinction that is of a kind that the state should enforce it. And one might perfectly coherently say that's actually itself not the kind of question that's appropriate for legislators wielding our coercive power to be in the business of trying um, uh, to, to work with. So I want to get to your, your last question. That's the right kind of question. Um, for any particular argument that's couched in religious or religious-like terms, there could be a claim that's couched in terms of values that are sufficiently shared within a democratic polity that they are permissible for the state to take into account. Um, what we'd have to do is look in great detail then at any particular such thesis with respect to this issue to see whether what you have is a value that is A, sufficiently broadly shared that it doesn't violate the notions of political legitimacy I've been proposing, and B, sufficiently strong that it would override um, the general thought that one ought not to infringe somebody's individual um, liberty, whether the general idea of the value of the citizen, um, that I'm, I don't know that piece of elements, but um, would have that, would be sufficiently strong. My impulse is to say I doubt it, but here we'd have to look very carefully. I'd have to let you really develop the argument rather than to just have taglines back and forth. In NATO, we quill, the court looked at the philosopher's right. brief. Mm -hmm. this year, mm -hmm. and that was 1997, right. the opinion. And in that opinion, they unanimously, nine hill, rejected the idea that there was a liberty interest in assisted suicide. And they, they took up that question, mm -hmm. and there were six opinions, and, and each of the opinions right. rejected that notion. And, that, and, the, See, and, and this is a right. court that is broadly divided right. in liberal and conservative mm -hmm. policy. I mean, I'm not going to speak to the constitutional jurisprudence. Keep in mind that what they said was that there is not a, a, a liberty interest that is um, embedded in the United States Constitution. I'm not a constitutional lawyer, so I'm not making the argument that they were wrong on constitutional grounds. Um, the argument that I'm making is that when we ask what the whole idea of a fundamental liberty is, one wants to ask, why do we talk about such things? Why do we think that, in general, 
government ought not to infringe such things and ought to be held to a certain kind of standard for justifying reasons when it proposes to do so. And my thought, which is simply that of the philosopher's brief, um, make no claims to originality here, is that um, liberty is important, among other things, because it, en it enables you to lead your life in the way that you think is important, according to your own beliefs and values. And it's because liberty is important that way that certain specific kinds of activities ought to be protected, such as religious liberty. The protection of religious liberty, of course, in constitutional legal terms, comes out of pragmatic considerations as much as anything else, the need to end the wars of religion in the 17th century. But if we abstract from that and say, why should li um, religious liberty be, be protected if we didn't think people would go to war for on its fringe? I take it the answer is, gee, this is a fundamental part of what it is to have a vision of life. And that any kind of liberty worth having involves um, being able to pursue your vision of life, assuming it doesn't harm others, um, and that that's why it ought to be protected. And now, all I'm adding to that is the thought that for at least some people, how one dies is part of a vision of how one lives. Um, that's why I quoted the Vellaman piece. Um, and that if that is so, then it looks as if the choice of how one dies um, is not a thing that the government should infringe, at least shouldn't infringe it except to regulate it. And then we get into the question of what regulation is appropriate. Yeah, Con and concerning the whole notion of regulation, you know, I, I really like your argument. I think you make a compelling one for for the moral right for it's not mine, for, but it is for a suicide. Compelling well, you make it. Um, my concern um, comes from the, the whole notion of of regulation and mm -hmm. and government involvement and the bureaucracy, and the the tendency for that to um, to to make a mess of things and how that how that impacts on the whole argument um, from a moral perspective of whether or not the government should be in the, should, should take it on itself to sort of, um, to direct this kind of uh, well, well, so undertaking. That's an, I mean, that's an interesting question. So um, there is, um, I mean, here I defer to the people in the room. You have practices, I take it, that make you sufficiently comfortable when patients either refuse life-saving care or asked to have life-saving treatment withdrawn. And I guess I don't know whether how far the law has played a role in the evolution of those practices. I doubt that you think much about the law in the course of daily activities there. But presumably, um, over time, um, people, doctors, have come to some set of understandings <laughs> about what counts as sufficiently informed consent, what counts as a moment when you say, OK, this patient gets it. Um, I'm, you know, whether or not I agree with a particular decision, it seems to me the, the thing for me to do is to let the patient die. Um, all I'm proposing is that um, over time, we might come to similar understandings with respect to assisted suicide. Whether the best way to come to such things is through the creation of one or another government bureaucracy, whether it ought to be run through um, medical organizations, I have no view. Um, one mentions government bureaucracies rather than medical organizations because one option here would be that, um, it would, that assisted suicide would be made legal, but physicians would not inv be involved in it, that you'd have some sort of separate subspecialty, th thanatologist or whatever. Um, um, you know, who have whatever counts as the appropriate um, training. Um, and and, and if, if that would be the case, then you'd probably want to have, you, you probably wouldn't want to have a brand new sub-profession self-regulating to begin with. You'd probably want to have the government in there. But exactly what the best form of regulation over time would be, that's again, that's where the idea of the laboratory of the states would come in. Hopefully, over time, one would begin to see what would work and what, what doesn't. Professor Brodney, um, extending your slippery slope uh, slide yeah. further, what, when do you think the government would be legitimately uh, prohibiting assisted suicide? I mean, 
you know, you think of examples of a group of people right. just wanting to commit suicide at age 30. Is there, um, when do you see, where do you see that line being drawn? Now, keep in mind that we're talking about a liberty right, not a claim right. So keep in mind that um, even if I have a liberty to do something, doesn't mean that anybody has a duty to help me. So um, there, I'm not suggesting, for instance, that um, there's any organization that, so I mentioned someone with a disability who finds life not worth living. I'm not suggesting that anyone has a duty to help that person die. Um, so that's, that's one thing just to be clear about. Um, but just to now to take your example sort of head on, um, I'm not quite sure what a regulation would look like that would be appropriate to criminalize voluntary activity. That is, keep in mind that by hypothesis, you were assuming that whatever you think of as the appropriate procedures for making sure that someone does not have clinical depression, um, fully understands the consequences of what he or she is proposing to do, understands all the data about how over time one adjusts, and you know, if you want to say the data shows that after a couple of years people get back to their baseline of happiness, you could say we won't even think about this until after whatever those years are. But as I say, for any set of regulations that you're going to propose, in principle someone will pass through every single hurdle. Um, and at that point, I have to admit, I'm not quite clear why we should criminalize what a person on due reflection after being psychiatric, eval you know, a psychiatric evaluation after all these hurdles, if they wish to do it, unless you think that suicide itself should be criminalized, right? I go back to the proposition that um, uh, if you think that suicide should not be a crime, and of course people might think it is, but then we get to the, again to the question, what's your reasons for thinking that it is? Or is this simply, I mean the original reasons for criminalizing suicide were explicitly religious. Locke says we can't commit suicide because we're not our own property, we're God's property. So it's kind of theft if you committed suicide. <laughs> um, but, but once you move away from that, and if you think that suicide um, ought not to be criminalized, then it becomes harder and harder to think why the state should forbid assistance I with it. I don't think that's correct. I mean, I don't think you have to be in favor of criminalizing suicide to acknowledge that suicide, all things considered, even aside the religious objection, mm -hmm. is not a good thing. It's society frowns upon it right. and, and does, doesn't see it as positive, even though it's not a criminal mm -hmm. action anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but by definition, uh, is not exactly the same as suicide. And I think you could clearly see that assisted suicide would equally, equally be an undesirable societal uh, benefit um, and, and, and be strongly against it, mm -hmm. even to the point, even to the point of criminalism. So but why you're not criminalizing right. regular suicide? So I think here you want to distinguish different things that a state does. State has the power of the purse, has the power of the sword, and it has the power of voice. All that I'm arguing is that its use of the sword ought not to be motivated by reasons of a kind that could not um, be of, of the sort that those who will be subject to the coercion could find acceptable. Um, what Dan was suggesting is there might be such reasons that might be weighty enough. As I said there, we'd have to really go to the mat with the details of the reasons to set that out. But this is separate from the proposition that the state might be permitted to use its voice to discourage assisted suicide. Philosophers, um, this is an area of philosophy that's very poorly dealt with. For the most part, philosophers still think of the state as simply an engine of coercion. Um, as an engine of coercion, and theories of the legitimacy of state action are almost entirely tied to the question of the legitimate use of coercive power, but that's just a mistake about most of what a modern state does. 
And it's not obvious to me that the argument that I've given also applies at least completely to the use of the state's voice. So there are things that it's okay for the state to say that it's not okay for the state to do. For instance, if we have, um, I don't know, you have some white supremacist religion, it's wrong for the state to shut it down. I see no problem with the mayor of a city saying, the values of this supremacist religion are at odds with the values of my city and our citizens, and we find them despicable. Our police will protect them from being harmed and so on and so forth, but we think they're despicable. There's not, so here, voice and coercion can come apart in terms of the legitimacy of state action. So I'm perfectly willing to at least countenance the possibility that it would be appropriate for the state to have greater freedom to criticize and argue for and in various ways agitate against um, assisted suicide and, and, and those who engage it. That's different from criminalizing it. I, I don't want this audience to leave with a feeling that there is a univocal decision in Glucksburg. Four justices specifically said we don't need to reach the question of a protected liberty interest in assisted suicide at this time because there is no state that has prohibited adequate pain relief at the end of life. And Souter, O'Connor, Stevens, and Breyer all explicitly said, if a state were to limit pain relief at the end of life, we would have to reconfront the question of whether there is a constitutionally protected liberty interest in some cases of assisted suicide. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a decision, or a pair of decisions, that are only superficially unanimous. They're very conflicted. Thank you. This is why I said I would not go into the constitutional law, because I don't know it. Thank you for bringing it up. My question is about the suicide itself, not Dr. Adam. Uh, I, and I think I understand the importance of value of life because if the value is diminished, then we do not value other people's and people may waste their life on some of the things do to harm others by committing suicide. But I wonder if you could explain to me why some people who are so strong on autonomy, like Kant, and yet he opposes suicide. And why like to know why a strong on this side and a strong on that side, and what is the philosophical basis as you understand it? So, um, the specific Thing that Kant says. I mean, Kant, um, Kant's own argument is a pretty bad one. Um, but putting that aside, um, we could try to help Kant out, and his answer would be that what he thinks of as supremely valuable, what ties human beings to God and the angels, if there are any, um, and separates us from other mammals is what he calls our capacity to set ends. And he thinks that this is very, is more valuable than our capacity for sensation. And he thinks that inevitably the choice to commit suicide involves valuing 
re the reduction of pain more than the maintenance of agency of the capacity to set ends. And this is therefore a failure to understand what is a value and a functionally means treating your own capacity to set ends as a tool to pain reduction and as such you're treating yourself as a mere means. So that is, that's the Kantian thought. You have to buy, to, for, for, to accept this argument, you have to buy Kant's thought that our capacity to set ends is what's so important, that agency is supernally important, um, and therefore any way to use it um, is uh, uh, um, for, for, for ends that are at odds with agency is forbidden. If you say, agent, hey, agency is pretty cool. It's pretty cool we can make choices. I'm all in favor of that. Um, but no, it's not the most overriding thing. Then Kant's argument is going to fail. We will make one last question. Thanks. I, I'm very curious about the, um, the line you and, and many others, I think, seem to draw between physical disability and psychiatric disability. That is to say, if it's OK for someone to say, I choose not to live with mm -hmm. this disability, I choose not to accept a treatment for it, right. and therefore to, to request right. uh, assisted suicide. Why is it not okay for a psychiatric patient, someone with a psychiatric disability, to say, I choose not to live with this disability or the life that the treatment would give me? I, I'm, I'm, I'm open on that one. That is, that's part of the slippery slope, um, is how far down the slope one goes. And so what I, the excuse me. What oh, the um, in part because it has to do, um, and but here I need to defer to the professionals in the area to judgments uh, about um, the possibilities of recovery. Um, and if, in fact, a particular con patient's condition was such that um, you know the misery was just unsupportable, and the professionals in the area were you know converged on the thought that for this patient, um, there's simply no hope of this misery being alleviated in any manner, shape, or form, then we may get this kind of, of argument. That, I mean, I, th I think that's, I, I don't want to blink at the thought that the, I mean, you know, you start with the argument with respect to non-criminalizing terminal cases, right? Um, but as I say, I see no philosophical reason why that's where the line is to be drawn. Good operational reasons, because you're not making much of a mistake if the patient's already terminal, right? Whereas you're making a bigger mistake if the patient is not. But once you move away from the class of terminal cases, then I think it, it would bear real serious reflections to try to figure out whether psychiatric misery um, is, for these purposes, to be thought substantively different from the suffering of any other kind. And I mean, this I think is going to is again where you're going to have to see how things work. That is, offhand, I'm going to agree with you and say that the fact that a person wishes to die is a flag, is a reason to think something is amiss, um, and therefore it's a reason for serious scrutiny, for psychiatric evaluation, and so on and so forth. Um, could there be someone who simply has existential angst, who is not in pain of any kind, uh, and who is not depressed and has no psychiatric disability, but just has read Sartre too much or something like that? I mean, I'd hope they'd first, you know, come to a decent philosophy course and, you know, get disabused of certain things, but. Yes, that's where the slope might, might lead. Um, and that then again goes to the question of 
on the one hand, do we have non-religious reasons for forbidding? And on the other hand, do we have adequate regulatory resources to serve this? Thank you.